Atheist Nomads, episode 155, Ghost Busting with Haley Stevens. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. Joining us today is my lovely wife, Lauren. Hello. And our guest today is paranormal investigator and ghost hunter, Haley Stevens. Hello, everybody. Oh my goodness. And as you can tell, she is from the UK. Uh, When I was in uh, England on the International Air Cadet Exchange, I had an Air Training Corps cadet tell me that every house in England is haunted. Haley, is this true? (laughs) Pretty much true, yeah. (laughs) What they're haunted by, though, I couldn't say. (laughs) (laughs) It's everything is so old. It is old, yeah. Um, Yeah, it really is like in in the town that i live in we have a bridge that dates from the 1100s and you don't really consider that until someone points it out to you like oh yeah this bridge that we're using every day it's like the only bridge that gets the town from one side to the other dates back from the 1100s it's really old and it's probably going to break apart soon but yeah everything's old and we were just talking about pokemon go and i play pokemon go and as i was going to work this morning i found a poker stop which was a local pub and on pokemon go it said um rose and crown the uk's most haunted pub and that was the first i'd ever heard of it being haunted so yeah i think everything is haunted in england <laughs> everything nice. ties together oh my gosh mm. let me put this into a, a tad was it a ghost pokemon that'd be awesome <laughs> <laughs> no i didn't get a ghost pokemon no. a, a, a tad of perspective for you Washington State wasn't even formed until 1889. I mean, yeah. yeah. 1892 for us in Idaho. Whoop, whoop. 1890. 90. Yeah. We're pretty cool like that. We're babies. <laughs> yeah. We're, yeah. So, not, we're, we're which not is even why we to drink, really. Which is why we explain why we're so <laughs> fucked up right now. So, Haley, uh, what's, what's your story? How did you uh, get into the whole... Uh, ghost hunting and paranormal investigation thing well i've always been interested in ghosts i think everybody says that you know since i was a child i think that's that's just something that everybody says but it's true um we lived uh the house that i grew up in um in a village small village called hilperton we were convinced that the house was haunted and it really it scared me i was terrified the whole time that we lived there but it was really interesting at the same time and then we moved out of there when I was 18. And around that time, we I decided to make my own ghost hunting team. And I was inspired by television shows like Most Haunted <laughs> and, and their ilk. And yeah, so then for two years, I went out ghost hunting. Um, and when I say ghost hunting, it literally was looking for ghosts. And in those two years, I started to kind of experience things that to me didn't quite make sense and I kind of explored it more and more and I found the rational information and about two years after starting out as a ghost hunter I stopped believing in ghosts and I I was gonna say spoiler alert there's no ghosts (laughs) yeah (laughs) right yeah pretty much pretty much dang it I became I became a much more rational investigator and I've been doing ever since really um just because it's it's really interesting, but also people do have these weird experiences that sometimes seemingly have no explanation, and sure. that really interests me. That's you know, I want to go out and solve that mystery if I can. Hmm. So you're like the skeptical superhero of ghost hunting. I don't think people would agree that I'm a superhero. In fact, there are a lot <laughs> of people out there who would who would tell you the exact opposite. Um, <laughs> you're a villain. But, you know, I am the villain. I'm the one who, who goes in. It's like it's like the Scooby Gang, you know, going in, tearing off masks. 
and unearthing hoaxes and stuff like that. Um, I've never torn a mask off of anybody, but you know, there's still time. There's yeah. plenty well, of time. That's what I always loved about. That's what I loved about Scooby Doo. I mean, in the in the cartoon, there always there was you know some old guy you know at, uh, they could yeah. always pull a mask off. But in the movies, there actually was a ghost that kind of irked me. Yeah, th- they were real ghosts. So, uh, well, one of them was Scrappy Doo. <laughs> Pulling a hoax. And nobody likes Scrappy um, Doo, so we forget no, about that no. one. Especially, especially not after that. Uh, for a, a <laughs> interesting coincidence, I guess is uh, I actually watched the Scooby Doo movie in a theater in Britain. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that would have been an Oxbridge outside of London. Uh, no, that yeah. building wasn't. Uh, no. <laughs> I met you. It was. I met the guy who played Shaggy <laughs> at Comic Con. He was Hell nice. Yeah. Yep. He really loves children. But, He's like, they're amazing. <laughs> okay. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, ghost hunting, though, you know, there are parallels that people kind of draw between paranormal research and Scooby Doo and the X Files and things like that. But in real life, it's, it's, you know, it's nothing like that, really. It can get quite tedious sometimes because you you imagine going out running around and hunting down these hoaxes and uncovering the truths and it being like these television shows that you see but really a lot of the time can be spent just sat behind your computer just reading notes and researching more than anything Mm. also it's just like every other scientific endeavor pretty much yeah (laughs) i'm gonna be indiana jones and go discover some lost civilization or I'll read like fifteen people's theses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you? Uh, well, it, it's always, it's always kind of irked me that you know you have all these people going out and basically believing things that are a little odd to begin with, but they all seem to make a lot of the same mistakes using the same equipment over and over, and nobody learns from their mistakes or from others' mistakes. Uh, yeah, haven't you yeah. done a, a little looking into some of the equipment that's been used? Well, I used to use the equipment um, yeah. when I first started doing the ghost hunting. Um, you know, I had all all the gear that other ghost hunters had had and that they promote on the television shows. And, you know, I spent a lot of money on it. And <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, the expensive equipment. <laughs> it, yeah, it's it really is expensive. And once you've spent all that money on that kind of gear and once you've spent all those hours doing your research, when you start to doubt that, you know, what you're doing is is the right way of doing it or that ghosts really do exist or that there's an afterlife and so on, you you know, that the money that you've invested and the time that you've invested can be something that can actually stop you from walking away from it because it's just such a huge part of of who you are and what you do. Um, I've still got some of the kit around here. And when I look back and think, why did I use that equipment? It was because other people did. And I I guess I presume that because other people were doing it, it must be right. You know, how could 200, 300 people be doing something wrong without anybody calling them out for it? But it turns out people were calling them out for it. I just didn't see that side of it. Um, and yeah and then you start to see the other logical fallacies but the equipment you know it's it's basic stuff like um emf meters there's this theory that ghosts will as they're manifesting and when when i talk about ghosts I, you know i could throw alleged and so-called into the conversation all day so if i don't <laughs> it's not because i'm saying ghosts are real it's just i get better for saying that all the time alleged um but when ghosts manifest, the idea is that they give off an energy that disrupts the naturally occurring electromagnetic fields around us. And you can detect these fluctuations using an EMF meter. And uh, it turns out that that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> there is also another side of it, where another theory where um, people believe that certain levels of um, e- EM fields can cause people to have um, not hallucinations as such, but they can feel strange stuff. And that kind of goes into pursing his God helmet experiments and so on. Um, but the bog standard EMF meters that ghost hunters are using are not going to detect fields like that, even if those fields were going to have um, that effect on them. Wow. So it's a lot more complicated. So you do have these people running around um, using these pieces of kit 
that don't actually do what they think they're doing. So they think they're being scientific, but they're not. And you find that um, what happens is you have these bog standard pieces of equipment that are used by ghost hunters and they're redesigned all the time by companies um, because it's profitable. So you'll find the EMF meter, there'll be probably 20 or so different types out there. And then you'll have a ghost box, which is something that people use to talk to ghosts in real time and um, there'll be various versions of those too uh, they've even reinvented the Ouija board um, so rather than just being a board there is now one that's a two tier board so you've got two levels of the Ouija board and the top tier is on a spring and it kind of goes backwards and forwards and so yeah you know I think there's a lot of money to be made from people who believe in ghosts and that's why you see this kind of this I don't know constant stream of new equipment so it's like religion is very profitable <laughs> and hard to leave <laughs> um i think that yeah there are some similarities with religious beliefs and obviously um some people who investigate ghosts and believe in ghosts that is their religious belief you've got the spiritualist movement of course um in the uk that's really big in the uk isn't it or well, getting yeah it. yeah well we've got the nus which is the national union of spiritualists i believe that's the the title and that's a you know a proper um religion that you can follow you can go to their churches and their events and so on um it, and it's it's kind of christian but it it, it involves uh, spiritualism too doesn't it it does very much so and you'll normally find that they have psychics um and mediums doing readings at their congregations and so on that's pretty yeah. old school Man. stuff so you there. Gotta, so you yeah. got a two-dimensional uh, Ouija board that's uh, starting to encroach on the 3D chest that Star Trek has. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my favorite pieces of kit was always the uh, radio scanner where <laughs> like, uh, it, yeah. it scans through different radio frequencies looking for words. And Well, there are two different, well, there are several different types, but the two that I'm familiar with um, is the ghost box, which I mentioned before. That is supposed to give you real-time communication and it does that by skipping through um, different radio stations and normally what would then happen is the radio would stick to one channel but there's a way you know there's a function that just keeps it skipping through and the theory or I say theory the hypothesis behind that is that the ghost will use that chattering noise and that that um, that sound to communicate so you'll catch snippets of words and that's the ghost. But, you know, in, in real life, what's actually causing that is that radio stations happen to broadcast words. And yeah, sounds. I was going to say, and, that doesn't make know, sense. <laughs> um, and sometimes when they are mixed together um, in a random sequence, as they are if you're skipping through them every second or so, um, you start to hear meaning where there is none. It's pareidolia, basically, um, auditory um, illusions. The other thing, um, which is kind of similar, um, I, I actually feel quite old when I talk about this equipment because I haven't used a lot of this because it's all new. So once I gave up ghost hunting, I stopped buying the equipment because I had other stuff to buy, um, you know, to spend the money on. And um, so all this new kit comes out and I have to try and keep up. And I feel a bit like an older person trying to keep up with the kids and their technology. Um, but the... <laughs> The other kind of um, audio thing that ghost hunters use, um, well, there's good old-fashioned EMF, um, no, EVP, sorry, which is electronic voice phenomena. And that's where you re you record on a dictaphone or maybe your iPhone or whatever, and you say, is there anybody there? And you leave a gap. And then you say, what's your name? And you leave a gap and so on and so forth. And then you play it back and you're meant to be able to hear the voices of the dead answering your questions um obviously the ghost box takes out the delay it's, it's direct communication and then you've got a device called the ovilus um and you can also get an eye ovilus which is for your phone and <laughs> this um dang it apple you, you really can yeah and <laughs> basically um I can't quite basically it detects the it measures the em fields where you are and it's claimed that um, scientists um, have associated different words with different EM ranges and spikes and fluctuations and so on. So as 
as the electromagnetic field changes around you, this is apparently the ghost trying to communicate a certain word. And so onto the screen will appear all these different words. And um, what tends to happen is there'll be, say, 10 words, and then one of them or two of them might match or somehow fit the ghost story that's associated with the location. And then the ghost hunters will go, oh, look, it says boy and drowned or boy in water. And we know this little boy drowned that haunts this pub. So this must be proof. Does and this happen a lot of pubs? It, it does, actually. <laughs> um, when I went out on these, you know, good old fashioned ghost hunts, um, we mostly went to pubs and we would end up there going to the pub and waiting for it to shut. And then once it had shut, we would then do the ghost hunt. Um, and more and more now you find that a lot of locations that have um, uh, kind of historic hauntings associated with them, that back in when I was a ghost hunter, you wouldn't have had to pay to go there. Um, now you do. Oh. Um, and uh, they've they've worked out that they can make a profit, and actually, I don't necessarily see that as being a bad thing. Um, hmm. Ghosts are for paying customers only. <laughs> well, I think yeah, it, you know, it's it opens everybody up to the possibility of being scammed, and we know that people do hoax stuff so they can charge people to come in. But also, it does mean, I mean, in England, we've got like you said, we've got some really old places. And they are usually owned by charitable trusts who have to raise a certain amount of money to kind of upkeep the building. Oh, um, yeah. And one way of raising that money is by allowing ghost hunters to go in and do these events. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's a good idea. Um, but again, there's still some scope there for um, kind of some kind of harm to happen if, if people are being misled. Um, so I think the venue does need to make sure it's happening in an ethical manner, but a lot of them do. And, you know, I've, um, worked with a couple of historic houses who have wanted to draw up some kind of code of ethics that investigators have to abide by. So, you know, there is progress being made. Um, but having to pay to go into these locations means that people are looking for other alternatives. And so you find they end up in pubs and offices and, you know, the graveyards and so on um, where they don't have to pay. I was kind of wow. thinking a three drink minimum to get into a pub would be a, 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 probably a bonus for them. Everybody wins <laughs> more, then. More likely to find something. <laughs> well, I suppose it could be argued that pubs are full of spirits, but mm -hmm. not yeah. the ones they're looking Pete fell, fell he he didn't fall down. He got shoved. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So let's measure some EMP and see what's going on. Interestingly, um in I think it was oh my gosh, I think it was two thousand and seven. I might be wrong. Um, but um smoking was banned in public places in England. Um mm. and you notice, or at least I, this is just anecdotally, um, but I'm, I certainly noticed, and I know that others did, um, a drop, uh, quite a decrease in the number of photos of um, strange mists that people were taking. Um, nice. And and I think there was a direct correlation there, but um, I don't know. It's well, maybe vaping will bring that back. <laughs> maybe it will, yeah. Let people vape Damn in it. bars so they can have their ghosts back. <laughs> Uh, well, the UK is actually uh, at least the 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 what public health England and uh, one of the physicians associations are uh, definitely encouraging uh, allowing vaping in public and uh, yeah being very cautious with introducing new regulation. Basically, the opposite of what the uh, FDA yeah. is doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure we will see an increase in ghost photos. Yes, <laughs> great. <laughs> at least it means i've got something to do now so yeah all right well <laughs> let's uh take a quick break and uh we'll be back in just a moment atheist nomads is proudly brought to you by archway hosting check out their low price full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com that's a-r-c-h-w-a-y hosting.com hey we're also brought to you by listeners just like you Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. And we're back. 
So what would you say is, have you found anything that was difficult to explain? Yeah, I've, I've had very strange experiences. Um, I think anybody who investigates weird things is going to experience them. I mean, that's just the nature of, of these experiences that people report to us because, you know, at the root of these experiences and these strange happenings is a rational cause. We just don't know what it is. So when an investigator like myself goes into a place or starts to investigate a case, the chances are that we're going to experience it too. And we just have to try and work out what it is. Um, the weirdest thing, it wasn't scary. Um, that you tend to find things are scary and then things are weird and they're two different categories. Um, and whenever I've experienced something really weird, I've never been terrified by it. I've never run off screaming like you see on these television shows and on <laughs> YouTube channels and so on. Um, there have been instances where I've run off screaming, but it tends to be somebody's come around a corner and startled you and, you know, scared you silly. Um, uh, you'll never get a TV show without some drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there, there is always drama, but that can be explained. Um, but the stuff, the really weird stuff, it kind of happens and then leaves you wondering what the hell just happened um rather than freaking out and the weirdest thing uh, i was in this old i can't remember when it dates back to but it's an old manor house it's a huge huge place that's been turned into a hotel and um the family that owned the manor house they had a chapel built within the actual house so they would they lived in the house and they would go to church within the house and so would the the staff and so on um, and the chapel is still there. It's kind of as it was, um, which is like a nice feature for the hotel. And we're in this chapel and we're setting up um, a camcorder on a tripod because it's reported that a figure is seen coming from the back of the chapel and down the aisle. And we're wondering perhaps it's just a person cutting through. Um, so we're going to catch it on camera, hopefully, um, and then work out if it's a person or not. And as I'm setting the camcorder up, somebody grabbed my arm from behind. And you know when someone's pulling your arm to try and get your attention? Um, yeah. It was like that. And I turned thinking that it was my colleague and there was nobody there. Um, and I can't mm. quite explain that one. Um, I think it could have, you know, looking back, it could have been a muscle spasm or I was wearing a shirt. So it could have been the shirt relaxing or tugging on my elbow. Um but yeah, that one was quite puzzling for a while. Um, and there, have been, there was another case in a shopping center in a town near where I live. It's said to be extremely haunted. Um, it used to be, um, it was a castle and then it was um, mills from the 1400s. And then, you know, from the uh, 1980s, there's been this shopping center there. And it's said to be supported by all sorts of things. Typical and 80s. We, yeah, <laughs> typical 80s. And we're in there and we're investigating. And um, actually, we're not even investigating at this point. We're just stood there trying to work out who's going to go where because it's such a huge area to cover. And we're stood in, you know, like in shopping malls, you have all the shops, then you have the bits in between. Um, we're stood in one of those areas between all the shops. And there is like a stand that sells, I think they were selling handbags or something. And that was all covered up for the night. And we stood on one side of that. And on the other side of that, we, we suddenly realized we could hear somebody singing. Um, so we ran around both sides and we met on the other side and there was nobody there. So we assumed they were inside the stand and we, we kind of went under, there was nobody there. And we're inside kind of the stand looking for them and we hear somebody laughing. And I'm pretty sure that was a prank. I just, <laughs> I just, I feel confident that we had all angles covered though. But, you know, there's still a chance that that was just somebody uh, kind of messing around with us. But that one was quite weird and creepy. At the time, we felt like we couldn't explain it and that there was no way nobody, anybody could have gotten away. If I was given the chance to go back in, obviously, then we could explore how maybe somebody could have done that and then run away. But, until then, just that's a one of Bluetooth those. Speaker. Maybe, but we didn't see anything like that. But yeah. I didn't think about that actually. Hmm. I, I have a little battery powered Bluetooth speaker that I could put anywhere, and as long as I'm within you know forty fifty feet of it, I can broadcast to it. That's interesting. I didn't think of that, but yeah, there you go. It's one of those things we will never know. 
<laughs> so you've been to some pretty interesting places. Yeah, some some I have. Um, all sorts of places. The thing with ghosts is that people tend to think that they don't haunt places, they haunt sites. So, you know, you could build a house, a brand new house, and it could be haunted because of what was on the land before. So you tend to find that ghost stories are associated with all sorts of buildings, regardless of what the history of them is. They're quite interesting, really. Yeah. And obviously I say that not believing in ghosts. Um, I, I tend to think of ghosts as a cultural phenomenon rather than a paranormal or supernatural phenomena. Um, so when I start talking about things like that, people get really confused. So like, hang on, you don't believe in ghosts, so what are you talking about? Um, but when you look at the cultural aspect of, of ghost stories and hauntings, it gets really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Ben Ben Radford did a lot of study into like the Chupacabra and saying that that came out mm. about the time that uh, a movie did back in the early 90s. Uh, do you see any any tie in between like oh say ghostbusters the movie and and stuff like this becoming more popular i don't know i don't know if i buy that people that ghosts become more popular because of television shows and, and movies and so on um i can see that maybe ghost hunting would become a bit more popular with television shows but it's quite difficult to know for sure because um, pre Most Haunted, you know, which was uh, early 2000s, there was not really any way of, of communicating with uh, paranormal teams across the globe. I mean, yeah, there was the internet, but nobody was really making these large communities. So you, it's it's difficult to know how many paranormal teams there were pre Most Haunted compared to now. Um, and with things like the X Files, I saw people freaking out a lot. Um, about how the X Files was going to make people believe in all sorts of weird things, and um, the paranormal was going to become much more popular. But actually, the paranormal has always been popular, and exactly all over been... the world. Yeah, and most polls, um, when when the public are kind of quizzed about this, about fifty percent of people say they believe in ghosts or have had a paranormal experience, and it doesn't really change all that much. I mean, it does change, but I think that's more about the questions that are asked rather than you know the belief levels of belief but i think roughly about 50 percent of people tend to say that they believe in ghosts and that, i don't oh. think that really i don't know i think i think there definitely need to be studies into it what can make people believe when they didn't believe before i know there have been studies um about what people can perceive to be more true when they're watching shows about things like ufos and so on but when it comes to things like Ghostbusters and uh, the X Files and things like that, I don't know if there's any um, any link. I really don't. Well, I know that there uh, is. I think they they helped. Uh, I think they helped like people get into government conspiracies. But other than that, not really monsters. <laughs> I don't know. I think you would have had to have believed in government conspiracies a bit before. Um, I, I don't, don't know. I don't know if. <laughs> well, yeah, especially now, but um, in modern times, there's yeah all sorts of stuff going on. But I f I don't feel as though television shows could be a trigger. I think that there would have to be something already in place for people to to believe, you know. And you look at the X Files, and it's not just paranormal ideas. So it's not just about um, out of body experiences. It's out of body experiences and going and killing somebody whilst you're having an out of body experience or it's not just abduction it's you know it's kind of super paranormal ideas that are being promoted and you know there probably are people out there who believe in that but i don't think they believe in it because of the x-files i don't know no but i do know that there are some people who believe because of the paranormal investigative tv shows i have met a few people who are like well they're showing it on TV. Yeah. What more proof do you want? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, we're on a different wavelength there has, here. Yeah, there is. Uh, there have been some studies that have shown that if these television shows have disclaimers, people are less likely to believe what's being portrayed on the television screen is true. So if, really? if the hmm. yeah, if the, I, 
can't remember the act, exact studies. I have blogged about them um, because I was really curious about this and I researched into it and I read a load of different papers. And um, they showed the same shows to people, um, some without disclaimers and then some with different disclaimers. So some that were very strong disclaimers and some that were just, you know, the, the regular kind of disclaimers. Um, and they found that people who watched the show without a disclaimer were more likely to agree that the events had happened. So there is, I think, when it comes to um, documentaries about the paranormal or shows that present themselves as factual, like Ghost Hunters and um, uh, Most Haunted. And I think... What aliens is, building the pyramids. Yeah, Ancient Aliens. And I think the latest uh, ghost hunting show in America is Ghost Brothers. Um, really? Which is free, free black men going out ghost hunting. Um, I think one of the taglines was something with, like, why is ghost hunting so white? Um, which, again, is another <laughs> completely fascinating subject. Um, but, yeah, these shows often present themselves as factual when they're not. They're nothing close to factual. And I think that can sway people. I think, But I think there is a I, – I personally, I feel as that there is a distinction between the shows that um, present factual information that may not be factual and um, fictional shows. I'm not sure how people react to, you know, those different genres. Wow. All right. Well, we're going to take another break. But before that, uh, we do have some feedback coming in off of uh, the live stream. <laughs> uh, Shimera Productions is complaining that it keeps cutting out. Sorry, I uh, Sorry. shut down a bunch of uh, network processes that I forgot to turn off before we started this. Uh, I think that's helped, but YouTube is still reporting that the stream status is... Oh, now saying it's good, but mostly it's been saying it bad. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, still trying to figure out what's oh, going shit. on. Uh, maybe I could blame the weather. It's it's a rainy Ghosts. day here, and we don't have that Ghosts. very often in Boise. Ghosts! Uh, Parker Ferguson it says, hi, wants a shout out because uh, he or she loves our channel. So, hi, awesome. Parker. And uh, okay. Psychic Con Man, after I explained about uh, on, the, on the chat about the uh, bandwidth issues and how this is still experimental, um, Psychic Con Man said, experiments are good, though don't try experimenting on reanimated corpse. It's a bit too slimy. Ew, body farms. Depends on what movie. <laughs> Depends on how far along it is. You really want to try reanimation before rigor mortis sets in. Otherwise, they're going to be all, Yeah. <laughs> Can be all sorts of messed up. All right. We're going to go ahead and play the break now, and we'll be back in just a moment. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. And we're back. All right. Uh, so, Haley, do you have a, a religious background at all? I wasn't raised religious. Um, my parents decided that my brother and I should be able to make those decisions for ourselves when we were adults. Um, but in England, the school situation is quite weird in that you can usually only get your children into Church of England schools. So even though we weren't um, religious at home, we were taught um, religion, Christ the Christian religion at school. Um, and of course, you know, as young children, um, we go to school when we're four here. And um, at that age, you just kind of take it all in. So we were being taught um, about evolution. And at the same time, we were being taught about Noah's Ark and, and things like that. So oh, wow. it's all very, very weird. <laughs> Yeah, really weird. And um, I explains when I why people are leaving school. religion in such massive, <laughs> massive amounts. <laughs> um, when I left primary school and went to secondary school, that's when I, beca I, I became atheist and realized just you know how sh how stupid the curriculum had been at primary school and how messed up it was <laughs> that we were taught about Noah's Ark and evolution. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure that. I didn't quite get evolution until I went to secondary school because of that. Um, because when you're when you're taught those things, you just assume that they're both true. Um, you don't. I, I mean, as a seven year old, I didn't think. Hang on, how can that be 
if that is you know you just don't spot those <laughs> holes in the logic um and then one day at secondary school which is uh, we go to secondary school when we're 11 or 12 i don't know what the american version is but um we have religious education classes and we had a teacher called mr mosley who was brilliant um and he basically got all of us to draw god he gave us all pieces of paper and we all had to draw god and i drew this kind of zeus like you know white hair in a robe kind of you know the kind of typical way that it was taught at school and i remember the girl sat next to me drew an alien and then some other people drew question marks um and some people refused to draw because you're not allowed to draw Ella and so on. And I remember that lesson in particular blew my mind. It completely blew my mind because up until that point, I had never really been exposed to all these different ideas. And it was a few years into um, secondary school that I started reading about atheism and so on. And yeah, long story short, here I am today. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so so two things then. Uh, our, our schools are actually broke up usually into three parts. Right. Uh, okay. We have kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then uh, middle school is usually six, seven, eight, or uh, six, seven, eight, nine. Then uh, or last seven, eight, year, nine, or just seven and eight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. But then usually like uh, okay. nine, ten, eleven, twelve for our, our high school. But uh, I just want to say that uh, your your doubts, um, all these doubts that you have, your unbelief. I mean, you're going to be proven wrong when all the glaciers melt either all ice caps melt and we have global warming and all the water rises and we're gonna like save the world because of ken ham's ark in kentucky <laughs> oh yeah the the ark that has like metal framing and stuff that noah definitely yeah, yeah. didn't have back in the day <laughs> well, yeah, totally. I said back in the day is <laughs> so it was real oh if you listen to uh <laughs> some of the, the creationist versions uh, of, of of everything allegedly um Archaeologists have found spark plug-like devices <laughs> from before the flood. <laughs> and so obviously they oh. had high technology. It was a very modern society. They just happened to uh, forget all of that when the population collapsed. I bet it was I think the aliens. they're called the Egyptians making well, batteries. Aliens. Aliens did it. They, they came down, they had the spark plugs, and they're like, go for it, Noah. <laughs> There's somebody th out there that believes that, I'm sure. <laughs> I still seem to recall the Egyptians making batteries with clay pots and wicks and such. Batteries, yes. Yeah. Not scaffolding. No. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, well, yeah, they, they actually did have lots of scaffolding. But they were it, very good at that. It was wood. Aliens. Aliens, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Aliens sold. built the pyramids. Yeah, I don't believe that, but yes, it's probably <laughs> true. Yeah, because that's one of those where there's a very simple, easy, logical explanation the way Egyptian society worked at the time was the agricultural season was two or three months long. Everybody worked agriculture for two or three months, and they had nine to ten months with nothing to do except for 16 to 18 hours a day of slave labor for the pharaoh. You get enough people, you can do pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they had one of the largest populations for any civilization at the time because of how incredibly fertile the Nile Valley was. So they were able to grow lots of crops, have a, a sizable population, and put everybody to work building things. And if you put 95%, 98% of the population onto building stuff, you can build some amazing stuff. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Rather than what we've uh, yeah. got. <laughs> <laughs> I think when people kind of say that it was aliens, I mean, like with Stonehenge, for example, I think they're really mm -hmm. kind of I don't know that it, I just feel so sorry for the people who actually built those things, you know, all the effort that went into them and mm -hmm. yeah. just aliens did it. Like don't <laughs> under don't underplay their role in history, god damn it. Exactly. <laughs> so what do you do mostly nowadays? You mentioned you don't use the kit or anything, you No. Um well I still have the kit but only for demonstration purposes and actually half of it's broken now because I just don't care about it. Um <laughs> When I have a case, um, it really depends on the case. What you'll find is ghost hunters, they'll take their, they'll have a kit in a bag and they'll go in and they'll use the same kit for every case, but not every case is the same. And so every case needs to have its own approach, its own investigation. 
And so what I tend to do is I'll get the person or the people who are having a strange experience to keep a diary. And every time they have a strange experience, they think may have been a ghost, I get them to write it down in the diary. And I ask that everybody does their own so that there's no kind of influencing going on between eyewitnesses. Though obviously I can't rule that out completely. Um, And then using that, you can build up a picture of what's going on and you can try and work out what information you're missing, um, you know, which could be the key to what's causing whatever's happening. And I don't always have to go on site because sometimes things just jump out at me and it's kind of glaringly obvious what's happening. Um, If I do have to go on site, I try and replicate the times at which things have happened. Um, And I try and think about, it's it's almost like having a puzzle and you've got pieces missing, but you don't know what pieces are missing. So you have to try and build the picture up of what was happening because the person who's had an experience has got, you know, that much information. They don't have, you know, an idea of what's going on around them, maybe in the next room above them, who's been doing what that day. Um, And so I try and build up that picture. And normally you find that the answer lies in that. Um, Obviously there's also, actually there's a lot of dealing with hoaxes. People try and pass, um, fakes off as ghosts all the time um usually because you can get money from the press now for selling your ghost photo um so you know there's a lot of trying to spot if something's a uh, kind of a hoaxed photo or video or something like that and um i do a i host a podcast called the spooktator and we actually at the end of each month we examine the news stories from that previous month to see you know uh, what was a hoax how it was done what cause this ghost photo in the newspaper and so on and so forth and it could be quite interesting oh cool but but when it comes to the cases themselves it is just trying to find that that kind of missing information um and you you do normally find that that is is the answer really and also sometimes you don't even have to go into it that deep sometimes you can just look at a video or a photo and you just know um from experience what has caused it because you've dealt with it before or another investigator has dealt with it um there's a really well documented case by ben radford who we mentioned before um i think it was the santa fe courthouse where something was caught coming down the stairs on a cctv camera and it turned out i think it was an insect or some pollen or something like that (laughs) going past the camera and everybody well most paranormal investigators have seen that um, case and um, when you're then dealing with a piece of footage that's quite similar you can instantly go I know exactly what this is um, you know is there a spider on your CCTV camera and they'll go oh yeah there is <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that is awesome yeah, that a spider helps. at six inches from the camera lens looks a lot different than something 20 feet away from it it does the yeah, you find... spider. <laughs> there, there's a really good um, video from a pub in Wales in here in the UK um of this thing and it just manifests and it's going over the tables in the pub and then it's cleaning a table it looks like it's got an arm going out and cleaning a table it just turns out to be a fly that's landed on the lens of the cctv camera (laughs) and because it's so close to the lens the the camera can't focus on it so it's just blurry and because it's like a night vision cctv camera it's just pure white because it's so up close to the ir light thing um and so it just looks like this weird white blob. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, yeah, a it very, cl- a very clean fly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So let's turn this uh, from ghost for just a little bit to uh, one of our favorite people, Sally Morgan. Okay. Uh, what? What's your? Can you tell <laughs> us your opinion of her a little bit? No, because I don't want to be sued. <laughs> Um, Ooh. Yeah, that, that's pretty much the, I, um, that's pretty much sentiment, sentiment I get from everybody. Yeah, British we, uh, libel laws. Mm, yeah, I've um, yeah, I've had a few kind of close brushes with UK psychics, and I try uh. and avoid doing that now. Um, so when I'm blogging, I, I'm very careful with how I word things. Um, and obviously, here in in the UK, we had Simon Singh versus the. British Chiropractic Association, which was a huge libel case. And at the time, um, there's an organization called Sense About Science. They released 
a guide for kind of science writers and bloggers on what to do if you get a libel threat. And uh, I took a lot of that advice to heart because I'm, I'm not rich enough to be sued um, and I don't want to be sued. But <laughs> when it comes to Sally Morgan, um, I have a lot of opinions. Um, I certainly believe that her husband uh, is a homophobe. Uh, that has been caught on camera. Um, oh, they have, you know, they've abused people um, protest, not protesting her shows, actually. Uh, there was a chap called Mark Tilbrook who was outside one of her performances handing out leaflets, telling people how to spot psychic trickery. And um, he caught on camera her husband and I believe it was her son-in-law um, abusing him, uh, verbally abusing him and threatening him. Um, I don't yeah, believe in psychics. It, it really was harsh. Um, they got fired. Um, I don't believe that psychics have psychic abilities. I believe that some people are very perceptive and they can trick themselves into thinking that they're able to read information about people that actually most people would be able to with a bit of concentration. Um, I've had plenty of psychic readings. I've had my aura photographed and read. Um, I've taken part in seances and so on. And I don't think that every psychic is out to con you out of your money um but i've never been convinced um and i think that there are gosh it's difficult to comment on individual psychics without getting into trouble um right but we don't I want you getting into trouble it, so no and i don't want to get into trouble American like, ones. <laughs> um well i just think when it comes to celebrity psychics you can look at the things they're doing and nine times out of ten you can find a rational um, method of achieving their outcome and with Sally Morgan I, f I think it's very interesting that the more people have criticised her work um, the, the less she seems to do in her shows um, there was some, she does this thing where she has like a big dish and you write on a card what you, who you want to contact basically, you put it in the dish and then it goes onto stage and she randomly selects someone's name out of it or something like that. I don't know the full details. And somebody put a fake card in with a fake name and so on and so forth. And she um, picked up on this fictional ghost, which happened to be, I think it was a character from a television show or something like that. And that made the news and that made the headlines. And it was reported by people in the audience of her shows following that, that she no longer did that. And I think when people are criticized, if they react like that, you have to ask why they're doing that, why they're reacting in such a way. And when, um, when psychics refuse to be tested, I think you have to ask why. Whether you're a believer or a non-believer, there are genuine questions about why they're refusing to have their abilities and their claims tested in controlled conditions. And there are psychics out there who do um, come forward and have their abilities tested. Um, the Merseyside Skeptic Society, for example, they ran for a few years, they ran an experiment, they ran a challenge and they did experiments with psychics with um, Professor Chris French. And those psychics came forward and um, they failed the test basically, but at least they had the balls to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and when somebody doesn't, I think that, you know, if you're someone who believes in psychics, you have every right to go to a psychic show, but maybe you should be asking questions about why your psychic isn't engaging with the people who are criticizing them and not necessarily people who are throwing abuse, at, you know, because Sally does get a lot of abuse um, thrown her way, but from people like Simon Singh, uh, reasonable people who are just asking what I think are reasonable questions. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you have you had the MSS challenge. James Randi has an easy million for people to win. I don't and think the million dollar challenge is still in existence. I, I think they've stopped hmm. it, haven't they? Uh, within the last year or so. Okay, well maybe uh, they have. I don't know. I'm really not sure. Um, I thought they always did it at TAM or some other large venue. Oh, well, they'll, they'll do it being... whenever it's, they have somebody who's willing to do it and gets gets through the selection process. I'm but not sure. I, I was under it. the impression it had, it had finished, but um, I, I don't know for sure. I know that they've, they, the last one was in 
2015, I think. I'm not sure. It, Don't quote me on it, that, though. It yeah. has been uh, terminated. I'm, oh, uh, I just looked it up right on yeah. the uh, the James Randi website. I knew there oh. were changes within the organization. Um, and I was pretty, yeah, I knew, I thought the challenge was one of those changes. But, yeah. Well, that makes me sad. That's because but, you know, uh, well, there they... are plenty of other ways in which people can <laughs> go about being tested. There are uh, parapsychology departments at all sorts of universities across the, the globe. Um, and, you know, there are organizations like the Merseyside Skeptics Society and, you know, the Independent Investigations Group. I think they're still going. Um, you know, so there isn't a lack of ways in which psychics can put that money where the mouth is. Um, so you have to ask why they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. And the, uh, the million dollar challenge was terminated when James Randi retired. That's right. Yep. Okay. Which makes sense when you actually go into retirement wanting to have your million dollars back. <laughs> He's no spring chicken. Yeah. No, no. Uh, All right. Let's seven. Something like that. Let's go ahead and take our last break, and then uh, we'll go ahead and conclude. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. $1 $1 an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. Do you have any uh, any big plans coming up? No, I don't really. Um at the moment I've just started a new job and Yay. um yeah, and I'm planning to start studying um, in October um, towards a degree in social psychology. Um, All right. So that will probably take up a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, the biggest <laughs> thing coming up, I suppose, that's kind of related to the whole skeptic thing is QEDCon, which is happening in Manchester in October also. Um, I think it's the fifth one. Fifth or th- I can't remember how many there have been. I think it's five. Um, but it's, it's um, a whole weekend of science and skepticism and, and all sorts. In fact, they start on the Friday with a skeptic camp, um, which is completely free to everybody. Um, nice. I've been every year. I've been on a couple of panels over the years. Um, so, yeah, I'm going there in October, which would be great. Nice. It reminds me of that quote from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where he argues God out of existence and ends it with QED. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, Yay. That sounds awesome. I think I think the QED stands for question, explore, explore discover. discover. That's it. Yeah, um, and that's organized by um, people from Manchester Skeptics and the Merseyside Skeptics. Cool. Yeah, Gavin and a bunch of people and Mike. Uh, Mike Michael yeah. Marshall, Mike Hall, and yeah, loads and loads of them. They do a brilliant job. Um, and the money is if any money that's left over goes towards two charities. So it's you mm. know. It's it's really good. Oh yeah, uh, I mean that's probably one of the the cheapest and best uh, conferences around. If you could ever make it, do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really recommend it. Um, usually, uh, the Manchester Skeptics have their Skeptics in the pub on the Thursday night. Then you have Skeptic Camp on the Friday, and then you have the conference on Saturday and mm. Sunday. So. You know, and you meet skeptics from all around the world, all across Europe and uh, further afield, and it's absolutely fantastic. And with the the pound uh, crashing, uh, it <laughs> should just get cheaper oh, no. and cheaper. Yeah, oh, no. for you maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks for bringing that up again. <laughs> Great, um, but if you know that I, every year I do this fundraiser where um, people donate money. And I spend it on tickets for people who can't afford one. And I've just uh, met my target. So Aww. there's enough for 10 and a half tickets, depending on whether they're students or not. So if anybody out there is listening or watching and thinks they'd like to go to QED, but they can't because they can't afford the ticket, if you go to my website, you can apply for one. And uh, the recipients are randomly selected. 
and so we can send people across the conference. That's that is very cool. nice. Seriously awesome. Yeah. The reason it, it started, um, and you know, it, it's I think I like to think you know it's like a, a good turn for you know a good community because so much comes out of this community. Um, but the reason I started, it, I have to be quite truthful, is that Joe Nickel was speaking in 2012 and one of my friends is a huge Joe Nickel fan and he couldn't afford to go so we ra- we tried to raise enough money for his ticket and in about four hours of doing so we'd raised enough money for like six tickets and the money kept coming in oh, uh, wow. so 2012 was the first time we did it and we, we sent about 15 people over to QED and said um, and we just carried on doing it every year since wow so that's awesome yeah, that's pretty fucking badass hey other conventions yeah, listen up. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow. don't don't charge like $1500, <laughs> Tam. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to a Tam. I would absolutely love to go to a Tam. The other one I've always wanted to go to um was oh my gosh, uh the one by the Center for Inquiry. Um mm-hmm. they have it every year, I think. I would love to go to those. Well, so I know, this, uh, I know there's the NCSS uh, yes, which is up in New York ish, which would be a- awesome. And not, yeah. you know, it's just New York. Skeptics Guide. And is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it is both a state and a city. It's in the city. Um, okay. Well, then you have to see <laughs> New York Skeptics city. Guide, and a bunch of people go to that one, which would be awesome. Yeah. 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 Or, or, uh, oh, any conference in Australia. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. See, this is the thing. Um, America and Australia are quite far away, so th- there are loads of different conferences that happen in Europe that I've been to. So Skepcon, um, and oh my gosh, Denkfest, and which is Fort Fest, basically. Um, all sorts. Sorry, of did you say Denkfest? D E N K Fest. Uh, yeah, okay. that was it. The last time I went to that one, it was in Zurich which is really, really cool. Um, okay. But there's, there just seems to be so much going on. Um, but yeah, QED is definitely a highlight on the skeptic calendar, I think. Nice. Man, Very Dank, cool. Dankfest sounds like it'd be a, a weed conference of some sort. Yeah. A bunch of stoners. Do you know what that stands for? <laughs> no. No? Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> and well, uh, I always just think of the smell. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyways, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, what things have you got to, to brag about? What shows, what, what do you got? What are you doing? What, where are you? Um, well, you can always find me out on my blog, which is Haley is a ghost.co.uk. Um, I've been blogging there since 2010 and, um, I'm currently doing a podcast called the spook taser. Um, it's basically myself uh, as a paranormal investigator and we've got um, Ash Price who's a magician and performer uh, mm-hmm. Paul Gannon Paul Gannon is basically he's well he's a comedian or at least he says he is and he's, <laughs> he's like um, I had to say it and he's like the world's <laughs> number one Ghostbusters fan so he, he does a show about Ghostbusters and um, at the moment he's in his element um we've also got <laughs> alistair coleman who's a journalist and charlie revel smith who's an author so we all kind of bring this unique we've all got these unique perspectives about the paranormal we bring them to the table and then discuss paranormal stories that have been in the news recently um that's called that's the spook tater and you can find it at spooktater.co.uk oh my god i can't believe i don't know my own podcast website yeah spooktater.co.uk um, and we release episodes every month. We were doing them twice a month, but we've gone back to just once a month, um, just so we can make sure that they're, you know, good quality shows. Um, awesome. but at the moment I, I do have a YouTube channel, but I'm not doing anything on there at the moment. Um, but once I've kind of got the work, the new job and studying in check, then, you know, I'll probably be producing some more bits, but we'll see. Very cool. Awesome. Yes. But the blog is the main thing at the moment. I'm I'm trying to write at least two posts a week. Um, and on there, I've also got articles, which we, we kind of discussed previously, the equipment that's used by ghost hunters and stuff. I've got articles and um, like a guide to ghost science. So that's all covered on there. Um, and I try and counter all sorts of 
um, news stories on there and claims that people make. But also, I guess I've always had this interest in the psychology of why people believe what they believe. So you kind of find on the blog all sorts of um, articles about the paranormal from quite a weird approach that you may not have considered. Um, One of the things that I talk about a lot on the blog is the ethics of ghost research. Um, hmm. because when, when you do ghost research, whether you're a skeptic or a believer or, you know, whatever you class yourself as, there is a real chance for you to do harm to the people that you're coming into contact with. And I know from experience that when you go out as a ghost hunter or an investigator, you don't think about it. You just don't consider the, the ethics of what you're doing. Um, and it isn't until something goes wrong that you then start to consider it. So um on my blog you can find my own code of ethics and you know i kind of hope that other researchers will write their own one that kind of looks a bit like that and they can use that as inspiration um but yeah i kind of blog a lot about paranormal research um from a perspective that most people who aren't paranormal researchers would never consider um the things that you probably aren't aware of that go on in the community and i like that your description on your site ends in yeah, well, you know, Monster Hunter. <laughs> Monster Hunter, Pokemon Hunter, grr. Yeah, I should probably add the Pokemon Hunter bit on there, actually. There but you go. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the, the Monster Hunting, that was never something I was interested in until I became a skeptic. And then I became fascinated with the, the monsters, ma- mainly lake monsters. Um, in 2012, um, I spent a week with Joe Nickel investigating British state monsters. And um, I recently joined the Fairy Investigation Society here in England, oh, which... That's cool. Yeah, I didn't know it existed, and then it relaunched. And it's been around since Victorian times. And Walt oh, wow. Disney used to be a member. Um, and so they they reopened um, applications for membership. And this time they were letting skeptics join. And I thought it would be a shame for there to be no skeptics. So, yeah, I'm also... Uh, a fairy hunter but that's more i don't know i haven't really done any fairy stuff um it's more just an observational thing um yeah it's a bit weird that's awesome. but then you know uh, being a paranormal investigator i think everything i do is weird so. mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, very nice well we should probably let you uh get ready for bed since it is uh <laughs> late in the evening where you're at <laughs> Okay. It's, yeah, not too late, but a lot later than where you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, a real awesome. pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you for it. having me on. It's been good to chat. Definitely been good to chat. So thank Lovely. you. Thanks for sharing your perspective. Yeah. All right. And for our listeners, we'll be back next week with news. And for YouTube, I will be playing the outro now. <laughs> The podcast you're about to we love hearing if from I can our get to the right like this. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing. There we go. Oh my god. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheist nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.